Chapter 25, Part 2 of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 25, Reigns of Jovian and Valentinian, Division of the Empire, Part 2. Before Valentinian divided the provinces, he reformed the administration of the empire. All ranks of subjects, who had been injured or oppressed under the reign of Julian, were invited to support their public accusations. The silence of mankind attested the spotless integrity of the prefect Salust, and his own pressing solicitations that he might be permitted to retire from the business of the state were rejected by Valentinian with the most honorable expressions of friendship and esteem. But among the favorites of the late emperor, there were many who had abused his credulity or superstition, and who could no longer hope to be protected either by favor or justice. The greater part of the ministers of the palace and the governors of the provinces were removed from their respective stations, yet the eminent merit of some officers was distinguished from the obnoxious crowd, and, notwithstanding the opposite clamors of zeal and resentment, the whole proceedings of this delicate inquiry appeared to have been conducted with a reasonable share of wisdom and moderation. The festivities of a new reign received a short and suspicious interruption from the sudden illness of the two princes. But as soon as their health was restored, they left Constantinople in the beginning of the spring. In the castle, or palace, of Medina, only three miles from Naissus, they executed the solemn and final division of the Roman Empire. Valentinian bestowed on his brother the rich prefecture of the east, from the lower Danube to the confines of Persia, whilst he reserved for his immediate government the warlike prefectures of Illyricum, Italy, and Gaul. From the extremity of Greece to the Caledonian rampart, and from the rampart of Caledonia to the foot of Mount Atlas, the provincial administration remained on its former basis, but a double supply of generals and magistrates was required for two councils and two courts. The division was made with a just regard to their peculiar merit and situation, and seven master generals were soon created, either of the cavalry or infantry. When this important business had been amicably transacted, Valentinian and Valens embraced for the last time. The Emperor of the West established his temporary residence at Milan, and the Emperor of the East returned to Constantinople to assume the dominion of fifty provinces, of whose language he was totally ignorant. The tranquillity of the East was soon disturbed by rebellion, and the throne of Valens was threatened by the daring attempts of a rival whose affinity to the Emperor Julian was his sole merit and had been his only crime. Procopius had been hastily promoted from the obscure station of a tribune and a notary to the joint command of the army of Mesopotamia. The public opinion already named him as the successor of a prince who was destitute of natural heirs, and a vain rumor was propagated by his friends, or his enemies, that Julian, before the altar of the moon at Carhe, had privately invested Procopius with the imperial purple. He endeavored, by his dutiful and submissive behavior, to disarm the jealousy of Jovian, resigned, without a contest, his military command, and retired, with his wife and family, to cultivate the ample patrimony which he possessed in the province of Cappadocia. These useful and innocent occupations were interrupted by the appearance of an officer with a band of soldiers who, in the name of his new sovereigns, Valentinian and Valens, was dispatched to conduct the unfortunate Procopius either to a perpetual prison or an ignominious death. His presence of mind procured him a longer respite and more splendid fate. Without presuming to dispute the royal mandate, he requested the indulgence of a few moments to embrace his weeping family and while the vigilance of his guards was relaxed by a plentiful entertainment, he dexterously escaped to the sea-coast of the Euxine, from whence he passed over to the country of Bosporus. 
In that sequestered region he remained many months, exposed to the hardships of exile, of solitude, and of want. His melancholy temper brooded over his misfortunes, and his mind agitated by the just apprehension that, if any accident should discover his name, the faithless barbarians would violate, without much scruple, the laws of hospitality. In a moment of impatience and despair, Procopius embarked in a merchant vessel, and made sail for Constantinople, and boldly aspired to the rank of a sovereign, because he was not allowed to enjoy the security of a subject. At first he lurked in the villages of Bithynia, continually changing his habitation and his disguise. By degrees he ventured into the capital, trusted his life and fortune to the fidelity of two friends, a senator and a eunuch, and conceived some hopes of success from the intelligence which he obtained from the actual state of public affairs. The body of the people was infected with a spirit of discontent. They regretted the justice and the abilities of Salust, who had been imprudently dismissed from the prefecture of the east. They despised the character of Valens, which was rude without vigor, and feeble without mildness. They dreaded the influence of his father-in-law, the patrician Petronius, a cruel and rapacious minister, who rigorously exacted all the arrears of tribute that might remain unpaid since the reign of the emperor Aurelian. The circumstances were propitious to the designs of a usurper. The hostile measures of the Persians required the presence of Valens in Syria. From the Danube to the Euphrates the troops were in motion, and the capital was occasionally filled with the soldiers who passed or repassed the Thracian Bosporus. Two cohorts of Gaul were persuaded to listen to the secret proposals of the conspirators, which were recommended by the promise of a liberal donative, and, as they still revered the memory of Julian, they easily consented to support the hereditary claim of his proscribed kinsmen. At the dawn of the day they were drawn up near the baths of Anastasia, and Procopius, clothed in a purple garment, more suitable to a player than to a monarch, appeared, as if he rose from the dead, in the midst of Constantinople. The soldiers, who were prepared for his reception, saluted their trembling prince with shouts of joy and vows of fidelity. Their numbers were soon increased by a band of sturdy peasants collected from the adjacent country, and Procopius, shielded by the arms of his adherents, was successfully conducted to the tribunal, the senate, and the palace. During the first moments of his tumultuous reign he was astonished and terrified by the gloomy silence of the people, who were either ignorant of the cause or apprehensive of the event but his military strength was superior to any actual resistance. The malcontents flocked to the standard of rebellion, the poor were excited by the hopes, and the rich were intimidated by the fear of a general pillage, and the obstinate credulity of the multitude was once more deceived by the promised advantages of a revolution. The magistrates were seized, the prisons and arsenals broke open, the gates and the entrance of the harbor were diligently occupied, and in a few hours Procopius became the absolute, though precarious, master of the imperial city. The usurper improved his unexpected success with some degree of courage and dexterity. He artfully propagated the rumors and opinions the most favorable to his interest, while he deluded the populace by giving audience to the frequent but imaginary ambassadors of distant nations. The large body of troops stationed in the cities of Thrace and the fortress of the lower Danube were gradually involved in the guilt of rebellion, and the Gothic princes consented to supply the sovereign of Constantinople with the formidable strength of several thousand auxiliaries. His generals passed the Bosporus, and subdued without an effort the unarmed but wealthy provinces of Bithynia and Asia. After an honorable defense, the city and island of Caesarus yielded to his power. The renowned legions of the Jovians and Hercleans embraced the cause of the usurper, whom they were ordered to crush, and, as the veterans were continually augmented with new levies, he soon appeared at the head of an army whose valor, as well as numbers, was not unequal to the greatness of the contest. The son of Hormistus, a youth of spirit and ability, 
condescended to draw his sword against the lawful emperor of the East, and the Persian prince was immediately invested with the ancient and extraordinary powers of a Roman proconsul. The alliance of Faustina, the widow of the emperor Constantinus, who entrusted herself and her daughter to the hands of the usurper, added dignity and reputation to his cause. The princess Constia, who was then about five years of age, accompanied, in a litter, the march of the army. She was shown to the multitude in the arms of her adopted father, and, as often as she passed through the ranks, the tenderness of the soldiers was inflamed into martial fury. They recollected the glories of the house of Constantine, and they declared, with loyal acclamation, that they would shed the last drop of their blood in defense of the royal infant. In the meanwhile, Valentinian was alarmed and perplexed by the doubtful intelligence of the revolt of the East. The difficulties of a German forced him to confine his immediate care to the safety of his own dominions, and, as every channel of communication was stopped or corrupted, he listened with doubtful anxiety to the rumors which were industriously spread that the defeat and death of Valens had left Procopius sole master of the eastern provinces. Valens was not dead, but on the news of the rebellion which he received at Caesarea, he basely despaired of his life and fortune, proposed to negotiate with the usurper, and discovered his secret inclination to abdicate the imperial purple. The timid monarch was saved from disgrace and ruin by a firmness of his ministers, and their abilities soon decided in his favor the event of the civil war. In a season of tranquillity, Saliust had resigned without a murmur, but as soon as the public safety was attacked, he ambitiously solicited the preeminence of toil and danger, and the restoration of that virtuous minister to the prefecture of the East was the first step which indicated the repentance of Valens and satisfied the minds of the people. The reign of Procopius was apparently supported by a powerful army and obedient provinces but many of the principal officers, military as well as civil, had been urged, either by motives of duty or interest, to withdraw themselves from the guilty scene, or to watch the moment of betraying and deserting the cause of the usurper. Lupincius advanced by hasty marches to bring the legions of Syria to the aid of Valens. Erinthius, who in strength, beauty, and valor, excelled all the heroes of the age, attacked with a small troop a superior body of the rebels. When he beheld the faces of the soldiers who had served under his banner, he commanded them, with a loud voice, to seize and deliver up their pretended leader. And such was the ascendant of his genius, that this extraordinary order was instantly obeyed. Arbito, a respectable veteran of the great Constantine, who had been distinguished by the honors of the consulorship, was persuaded to leave his retirement, and once more to conduct an army into the field. In the heat of action, calmly taking off his helmet, he showed his gray hairs and venerable countenance, saluted the soldiers of Procopius by the enduring names of children and companions, and exhorted them no longer to support the desperate cause of a contemptible tyrant, but to follow their old commander, who had so often led them to honor and victory. In the two engagements of Theatira and Nicolia, the unfortunate Procopius was deserted by his troops, who were seduced by the instructions and example of their perdiferous officers. After wandering some time among the woods and mountains of Phygia, he was betrayed by his desponding followers, conducted to the imperial camp, and immediately beheaded. He suffered the ordinary fate of an unsuccessful usurper. But the acts of cruelty which were exercised by the conqueror under the forms of legal justice excited the pity and indignation of mankind. Such indeed are the common and natural fruits of despotism and rebellion. But the inquisition into the crime of magic, which, under the reign of the two brothers, was so rigorously prosecuted, both at Rome and Antioch, was interpreted as the fatal symptom either of the displeasures of heaven or of the depravity of mankind. Let us not hesitate to indulge a liberal pride that, in the present age, the enlightened part of Europe has abolished a cruel and odious prejudice, 
which reigned in every climate of the globe and adhered to every system of religious opinions the nations and the sects of the roman world admitted with equal credulity and similar abhorrence the reality of that infernal art which was able to control the eternal order of the planets and the voluntary operations of the human mind they dreaded the mysterious power of spells and incantations of potent herbs and execrable rites which could extinguish or recall life inflame the passions of the soul blast the works of creation or exhort from the reluctant demons the secret of futurity they believed with the wildest inconsistency that this preternatural dominion of air of earth and of hell was exercised from the vilest motives of malice or gain by some wrinkled hags and itinerant sorcerers who passed their obscure lives in penury and contempt the arts of magic were equally condemned by the public opinion and by the laws of rome but as they tended to gratify the most imperious passions of the heart of man they were continually proscribed and continually practised an imaginary cause as capable of producing the most serious and mischievous effects the dark predictions of the death of an emperor or the success of a conspiracy were calculated only to stimulate the hopes of ambition and to dissolve the ties of fidelity and the intentional guilt of magic was aggravated by the actual crimes of treason and sacrilege such vain terrors disturbed the peace of society and the happiness of individuals and the harmless flame which insensibly melted a waxen image might derive a powerful and pernicious energy from the affrighted fancy of the person whom it was maliciously designed to represent from the infusion of those herbs which were supposed to possess a supernatural influence it was an easy step to the use of more substantial poison and the folly of mankind sometimes became the instrument and the mask of the most atrocious crimes as soon as the zeal of the informers was encouraged by the ministers of valens and valentinian they could not refuse to listen to another charge to frequently mingled in the scene of domestic guilt a charge of a softer and less malignant nature for which the pious though excessive rigor of constantine had recently decreed the punishment of death this deadly and incoherent mixture of treason and magic of poison and adultery afforded infinite gradations of guilt and innocence of excuse and aggravation which these proceedings appear to have been confounded by the angry or corrupt passions of the judges they easily discovered that the degree of their industry and discernment was estimated by the imperial court according to the number of executions that were furnished from their respective tribunals it was not without extreme reluctance that they pronounced a sentence of acquittal but they eagerly admitted such evidence as was stated with perjury or procured by torture to prove the most improbable charges against the most respectable characters the progress of the inquiry continually opened new subjects of criminal prosecution the audacious informer whose falsehood was detected retired with impunity but the wretched victim who discovered his real or pretended accomplices were seldom permitted to receive the price of his infamy from the extremity of italy and asia the young and the aged were dragged in chains to the tribunals of rome and antioch senators matrons and philosophers expired in ignominious and cruel tortures the soldiers who were appointed to guard the prisons declared with a murmur of pity and indignation that their numbers were insufficient to oppose the flight or resistance of the multitude of captives the wealthiest families were ruined by fines and confiscations the most innocent citizens trembled for their safety and we may form some notion of the magnitude of the evil from the extravagant assertion of an ancient writer that in the obnoxious provinces the prisoners the exiles and the fugitives formed the greatest part of the inhabitants when tacitus describes the deaths of the innocent and illustrious romans who were sacrificed to the cruelty of the first caesars the art of the historian or the merit of the sufferers excites in our breast the most lively sensations of terror of admiration and of pity 
A coarse and undistinguishing pencil of Ammianus has delineated his bloody figures with tedious and disgusting accuracy. But our attention is no longer engaged in the contrast of freedom and servitude, of recent greatness and of actual misery. We should turn with horror from the frequent executions which disgraced both at Rome and Antioch the reign of the two brothers. Valens was of a timid and Valentinian of a choleric disposition. An anxious regard to his personal safety was the ruling principle of the administration of Valens. In the condition of a subject he had kissed with trembling awe the hand of the oppressor, and when he ascended to the throne he reasonably expected that the same fears which had subdued his own mind would secure the patient submission of his people. The favorites of Valens obtained, by the privilege of rapine and confiscation, the wealth which his economy would have refused. They urged, with persuasive eloquence, that in all cases of treason, suspicion is equivalent to proof, that the power supposes the intention of mischief, that the intention is not less criminal than the act, and that a subject no longer deserves to live if his daily life may threaten the safety or disturb the repose of the sovereign. The judgment of Valentinian was sometimes deceived, and his confidence abused, but he would have silenced the informers with a contemptuous smile, had they presumed to alarm his fortitude by the sound of danger. They praised his inflexible love of justice, and, in the pursuit of justice, the emperor was easily tempted to consider clemency as a weakness, and passion as a virtue. As long as he wrestled with his equals, in the bold competition of an active and ambitious life, Valentinian was seldom injured, and never insulted, with impunity. If his prudence was arraigned, his spirit was applauded, and the proudest and most powerful generals were apprehensive of provoking the resentment of a fearless soldier. After he became master of the world, he unfortunately forgot that where no resistance can be made, no courage can be exerted, and instead of consulting the dictates of reason and magnanimity, he indulged the furious emotions of his temper at a time when they were disgraceful to himself and fatal to the defenseless objects of his displeasure. In the government of his household, or of his empire, slight or even imaginary offenses, a hasty word, a casual omission, an involuntary delay, were chastised by a sentence of immediate death. The expressions which issued most readily from the mouth of the emperor of the West were, Strike off his head, burn him alive, let him be beaten with clubs until he expires. And his most famous ministers understood that, by a rash attempt to dispute or suspend the execution of his sanguinary commands, they might involve themselves in the guilt and punishment of disobedience. The repeated gratification of this savage justice hardened the mind of Valentinian against pity and remorse, and the sallies of passion were confirmed by the habits of cruelty. He could behold with calm satisfaction the convulsive agonies of torture and death. He reserved his friendship for those faithful servants whose temper was the most congenial to his own. The merit of Maximin, who had slaughtered the noblest families of Rome, was rewarded with the royal approbation and the prefecture of Gaul. Two fierce and enormous bears, distinguished by the appellations of Innocence and Mica Aurea, could alone deserve to share the favor of Maximin. The cages of those trusty guards were always placed near the bedchamber of Valentinian, who frequently amused his eyes with the grateful spectacle of seeing them tear and devour the bleeding limbs of the malefactors who were abandoned to their rage. Their diet and exercises were carefully inspected by the Roman emperor, and when innocence had earned her discharge, by a long course of meritorious service, the faithful animal was again restored to the freedom of her native woods. End of section 49